The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We're back in the House of Mystery, and uh, joining us for the interview, we have the author of the book Mothers and Murderers. Now, this is a true story of love, lies, obsession, and second chances. So with us is Katherine Ellison. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's good to be here. So uh, this is quite the story. This is, this is a true story for you. This is, this is something that uh, you have been through yourself. So this is coming from uh, um, your own memoir in a way. So uh, tell us how this all started. Well, I was a cub reporter in 1981 when I got assigned to this trial. And the trial was a, a man who was a restaurant owner from Michigan. But the most charismatic person in the trial was his wife, who was not being charged. And I was just absolutely fascinated by her because she was a stay-at-home um, mother of three, casserole cooker, and yet there was something kind of sinister about her from the start. And I kind of got sucked into the story and then made a terrible mistake uh, and for which I got sued by her for $11 million. And after that, um, our lives were kind of connected for years to come. Wow. Um, so now, um, you were reporting on her husband then. Is that right? I was. He was the one who was standing trial along with, he had hired two men to um, travel from Michigan to California and shoot his wife's former husband at his townhouse door in Santa Clara. Wow. Now, why would he want to do that? Because it's the former husband. Exactly. That was the big question around the trial, and that's one of the things that um, it lay, it, it created an air of mystery around his wife, because where was she? Why did, you know, didn't she have the motive? And the prosecutor just didn't have any evidence against her, but he did have evidence against the husband, so he tried as hard as he could to concoct a a theory that the husband would gain financially from this murder. Wow. Um, and so now, what what happened in that trial? So did the husband get convicted then? Well, in the first trial, that argument about the motive just fell flat, and the jury hung on 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 the businessman, but convicted the trigger man because it was the trigger man actually confessed. But then there was a second trial, and he was sentenced to life without parole for the murder. But she was not charged. And, and my mistake was to, I wrote a story about the prosecutor's final argument, which had a lot of the wife in it. Her name was Judy Singer. And he just mentioned her name so many times that, I, you know, something <laughs> didn't click. And I wrote that Judy and Bob Singer had conspired to kill the victim, which wasn't what she had not been charged with that. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear's right. Well, that, yeah, I thought yeah. I... Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, and you know I understand it. You know, uh, both of us do we both write and do radio and podcast and that. So it's it's very easy to kind of just say something and not, you know, it, it's something that seems well, obvious. You know, and yeah, but it was really like you know. I mean, thinking back on it, and I was in my twenties then and not very experienced, but it was really like a surgeon committing malpractice. You know, leaving a a scalpel inside a patient or operating on the wrong organ i mean you're not supposed to do it or the copy editor should have caught it it was a it it was a terrible thing at the time but without giving away too much of the plot because there's lots of crazy twists and turns um the wife was convicted of the murder um the 14 years later oh mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so it's okay. Right, but I was still wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. The prosecutor never argued. I said he argued. If you could have had a time machine, you might have been right. correct. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, or if you had, uh, you know, lots of money to draw it out. Uh, so, so uh, when you when you reported that original story, uh, she caught it and she um, got a lawyer and actually. Um, sued you then? 
Yes. Um, two weeks, well, first she complained, and we ran a correction. And then two weeks later, I'm sitting in the press room, and the lawyer, who was her husband's lawyer in the trial, who, you know, we'd been great friends, he'd given me all sorts of outrageous quotes, um, he comes in and he apologized and he handed me a, the summons to the civil suit. Wow. And so what <laughs> happened to you at that time? Like, did, the, did the paper you were working for fire you? Did they stand behind you? How did that go? Well, neither, actually. Um, I had been making a lot of mistakes up until that time. I was um, very energetic and very dramatic writer, and they, they loved me for that, and I had a lot of front-page stories. But I also just kept screwing up in mostly minor ways. It was almost like a self-sabotaging kind of a thing that's not uncommon, I guess, for some young women. And... Um, you know, I mean, it was a it was a time when women were just really breaking into journalism and some of the good jobs in journalism, and it was really heady. I mean, I'd been educated to think I could do anything I wanted, but who knows what psychological forces were at play? But I was really undermining myself. So at that point, they they were quite nervous about keeping me on staff, so they suspended me for three days. And my managing editor, to whom I'll always be grateful, said, you really ought to get some help. <laughs> so so I did. And, and you know, in a very strong way, I'm, I'm very grateful to Judy Singer for kind of pushing me into that position because I don't think I ever would have looked at myself with the care that I needed to to kind of get on a better path. So, so you actually considered it to be uh, an issue yourself, like uh, about yourself, not so much just being an energetic um, go-getter of a <laughs> reporter. I mean, because I, I say that because personally, I think we've all been at the go-getter stage, and it's just, yeah. uh, you know, if, if you survive it as you get older, you, you, you're not quite so go-getter. It's more like just <laughs> get. <laughs> yeah, it's like get, but not go-get. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> how, how do you determine the difference between what's, just uh, being over anxious and pre-publishing things before you have, you know, maybe the, you know, the the proper credentials or or timing, as compared to. Oh, and it's say, really generous. It's really generous of you to frame this as pre-publishing. But what I did was it was it was by any uh, viewpoint a, a, a mistake. Right. Um, the prosecutor he came close to saying that the two of them conspired, but he did not say it. So when I said that Judy and Robert Singer plotted the murder, that was just plain careless. And if I'd have been more professional at the time, I would have sat down there and just looked at every word and made sure it was true. And I definitely got into that habit afterwards. But I had sort of an overconfidence or or who knows. I mean, it's, I think the unconscious is, is pretty fascinating. And in in that instance, I think it was a combination of really, you know, really suspecting that she had more to do with the crime than was being presented, plus some kind of crazy urge to self-destruct hmm. ended up with this mistake. Hmm. What year was this exactly? It was 1981. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, <could> you, <laughs> well, I say that because, I, you know, could you imagine, okay, right now, to the, 2020, um, there's so much um, unchecked and unfiltered news all over yeah. the internet, and all these groups doing all sorts of, you know, they're the absolutely. And and think about how much and and what you're doing, um, in my mind, is if you were at the trial or we were watching the trial, we would probably be going, well, you know, we know they're in it together. She knew about it, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Right, you'd yeah. be thinking because it's yeah. her ex-husband. So there's like that would just be what people were saying. So what you report it is just what people were thinking, and that's of course is a no-no on a legitimate news service because you're not allowed to do that. But um, right, and you make a really good point that news services, unfortunately, a lot of them are getting less and less legitimate, and and we're seeing more stuff on the internet that isn't checked. And I was incredibly lucky. I feel really privileged to have worked in newspapers during their heyday, you know, before they were all broken up and sold and that so many people were laid off because it was a it was an incredible practice, um, a discipline to 
become a, a, a more careful, accurate, um, and better writer, you know, writing under pressure. So it was, it was amazing training. I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. Oh, and going out and learning to get sources and actually getting uh, uh, information direct and all that. It's, it's, quite a, it's quite a talent. It's quite a, an mm-hmm. art to that type of reporting. So, uh, but now, even after all of this, um, did you, now, did you end up, how long did the court process take with this libel suit? Um, luckily, it was just about two, three years before she stopped pursuing it. Um, at first, they pursued it very aggressively, and I think that they, they actually thought that they could make a lot of money with it. Um, it our lawyer argued that, you know, he, he showed the prosecutor's words, he showed that, you know, he had almost said that, <laughs> almost said what I what I wrote, and, um, you know, we they, they filed a lot of motions, and we combated them, and and then she just stopped pursuing it. And a couple of things had happened by then. One, um, she was arrested for shoplifting, and um, and then um, it was it, it, one of the most amazing things about this story is it was revealed uh, through a, a long, crazy um, process uh, that she had been sleeping with her the attorney for her husband during the trial. So <laughs> this, this is the big. The, the the lawyer's secretary found a bunch of love letters um, from her in his in his desk, and sent because she hated him. She <laughs> sent them all over the place, including to us. And so at that point, um, Judy's reputation was no longer worth eleven million dollars, and I think she just stopped pursuing it because of that. Um, so the, the, it just the judge dismissed it, and it was no longer a problem. But during that time, this is another kind of interesting thing. Not only was I trying to figure out why I'd made those mistakes in psychotherapy, but I was also trying to regain my editor's trust. So I, as a freelancer, I went to Africa and Central America, and um, I'd always wanted to be a foreign correspondent, so I wanted to show them that I was a serious contender. And a lot of great things happened in the process, including that I met my husband. Um, so, so again, it's just it's just amazing how things that you think are the worst thing that could ever happen to you sometimes turn out to be the best. Yeah. Now, was that the same lawyer that actually served you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> His name was Bill Melcher, and may he rest in peace. Um, because uh, he passed away from cancer a few years ago, but he was he was quite a character. Uh, there was a, a special hearing um, to determine, it, it, you know, because once these letters came out, as you can imagine, Judy's husband was quite upset with her, and um, he volunteered to give evidence against her. But before that happened, they had to have a trial to see you know, if, the, if if she really had slept with his lawyer, you know, they had to have a special hearing to determine that. And that went on for weeks and weeks. And they had all sorts of evidence, you know, all sorts of evidence that this affair had happened. And uh, Bill Melcher, the, the lawyer, actually tried to defend against it by claiming that he was impotent ever since he had a vas- vasectomy. <laughs> and he couldn't have, he couldn't have slept with her. Um, and even put his wife on the stand um, to argue on his behalf, but in the end, uh, the, the the lawyers for I, don't, I hope this isn't too complicated to follow, but the lawyers for Bob Singer um, uh, came on and said that they had medical records that he'd been treated for venereal diseases after his vasectomy. So, oh. yeah, it was, <laughs> oh, it, was boy. it was quite an amazing hearing. <laughs> Yeah. My there, boy, that sounds pretty fun. <laughs> it was a, it was fun to read about because at that point I was kind of unhappy with them that they they had sought to to make so much money. I mean, I, I recognized that I made a mistake, but I thought that they had been, you know, kind of greedy to try to <laughs> take advantage of it. Well, yeah, eleven millions, crazy. And when what <laughs> what paper was it for? Was it like it's not like the New York Times, a national paper, right? <laughs> so. It was a San Jose Mercury, which was, you know, it was it was a fairly large paper in California. So, yeah, um, and it had a wire service um, with Knight Ritter newspapers. So now, uh, so you pulled yourself out of that kind of 
um, what do you call hole that you kind of yeah. got into there? <laughs> how, how long did that take? How long does it take to get out of something like that where your editor started trusting you again and people started taking your reports? Yeah, well, it was it was great because they they did stand by me in the sense that they kept me on the trial, you know, which was agony in a way because you know all the other court reporters knew that I'd been sued and I felt so embarrassed about it, but I had to just keep showing up and and just you know trying to be more and more professional, and so it was that was kind of a trial by fire. And then I did this foreign reporting that they really appreciated. So the suit was in 1981. And by 1987, they, they hired me to be the Mexico City Bureau for the paper, so the bureau chief. So I guess it took, you, actually, in 1984, they, they assigned me to kind of high-level series of an investigation of corruption in the So that was a, a great sign of trust. Um, and, and that series actually won, we won a prize for that. Well, good. I mean, uh, I, now, did you ever um, come to terms or figure out exactly why, um, or you might say understand why you think you made that mistake, as you call it? Well, you know, I couldn't give you a clear answer, but I think that there was an element of, um, it was scary to be, I'd kind of risen really quickly as a journalist and to the point where when I made that mistake, they were actually thinking of sending me to Mexico much sooner. And it was all really heady. And so there's there's something there, I think, and, and there's something there about just the atmosphere in the courtroom that, that Judy was getting away with it, that it was really her idea, that she was much smarter than her husband. So there was a little bit of that too. But one of the more interesting things was that um, Judy was a lot, um, in, in some very exterior ways, like my mother, who was also a stay-at-home mom, um, kind of had a cult around her children, great casserole baker, um, fastidious dresser. I mean, they had all these things in common. And um, my mother was, I was very close to my mother, and my mother was in a situation where um, she made, she was, she was in a way a victim of my father. My father was could be very cruel um and so we felt very guilty and very protective of her so i could never show any anger towards my mother so one theory i have is that you know i turned this anger that i couldn't turn on my mother towards this woman um but that's getting that's getting very psychological and who knows if that was really the reason but it felt right at the yeah. time yeah. Now, it, how did you feel, like, in, in 1981, how was it um, being a woman also in that position? Was that something fairly new to the to the business? Yeah, in, in that position as a court reporter, um, it, it, yeah, I mean, there, were, there weren't, most of our editors were men. The, um, most of the reporters with really good jobs were men. Were men. And so here was this wave of women who'd come through school, been educated during the 70s when we had all this progress in, um, you know, in women's education and uh, people were telling us we could do anything. And then we kind of hit up against the early 80s into the mid-80s was the beginning of this backlash uh, against um, feminism. And there were, I don't know if you heard of Susan Faludi's great book, which is called Backlash, where she kind of traces what's happening in the culture. There was that famous article in Newsweek that said that, you know, women who wait till their 40s to to find a husband have the same chance of finding a husband as being killed by a terrorist. (laughs) And there were all these stories about women who regretted having careers. and, And so all that was kind of coming into the culture. And, you know, it's, it's, it's quite possible that, 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 played a part in my being ambivalent about going for this big career, like, you know, would I would I also find a man who would marry me, you know, if I was if I was that into my career. Because um, I it, it was a generation in which so many women were leaving homes in which the mother was the homemaker and you had these traditional marriages and so we were you know, the boomer generation was was kind of cutting um, that cord or, you know, really distancing ourselves from our mothers at the time. 
Mm. And, and, you know, first they were burning their bras, and then Madonna was out playing with herself on. Um, I just heard the other day that the bra burning never happened, by the way. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. But that was a, a kind of an urban myth, um, that there were no bras ever, ever actually burned. But, um, but yeah, it was like when you look back at the, at the 70s, it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing how many important things happened, um, how much progress there was uh, for feminism then. And then there was this huge retreat after uh, Reagan was elected, and and we yeah. start talking about these quote unquote family values again yeah yeah it's pretty it's pretty amazing uh, you know living through it long enough now to see the big advancements in 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 women's rights or gay rights all these things and all of a sudden there's like a 10 year pullback and then it goes forward again and everybody's happy and then it goes back again it seems like we keep going through these cycles mm. yeah i mean i think there's been net progress when you look at what happened with our Congress, for instance, how many women were elected. Um, right. So things are kind of, you know, I mean, they are moving forward. There's so many women in professions now, so many women doctors and lawyers and in graduate schools. So so net, we're moving forward, but there definitely was a drawback in the, in the 80s where all of a sudden, if you're out there uh, trying to have a big career, there were reasons, more reasons to be doubting and questioning and worried. Yeah. Well, I doubt myself every second day, so. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been not because you're a guy. <laughs> no. I doubt, I doubt him even more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time we talk. Um, that's a, you know. Um, so is that kind of what, um, is that why you wrote the book? Um like what, what was what was behind you actually getting in 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 and writing and publishing a book? Well, I have to tell you that this book haunted me for more than thirty years, and that's you know it's it's almost a story in itself. I I started writing books. My first book was about Imelda Marcos, and and then I got a contract to write this murder story because after she was arrested in 1991, um, it seemed as if oh, here's the resolution of this crazy case that had so much. I mean, there's just so many outrageous parts of it when you when you start really looking into it. So I easily sold the proposal to Simon & Schuster, got a big advance, started going, you know, took a leave from my job, went all over the country, and um, wrote this book. But I, had, I promised the prosecutor I wouldn't publish or wouldn't send it to my publisher until she went to trial. And that she just delayed things till like 1995, practically. And um, so by that time, I had a new editor at Simon and Schuster, and and I I didn't write the book very well. I think because I had so many psychological issues with it that I hadn't really understood. And they canceled the contract, which is the only time that's ever happened to me. I mean, I went on to write nine more books, and it it, it never happened. But this one. It was like the one that got away. So yeah. things kind of slowed down um, last year, and I had some. I had time on my hands, and I went back to it, and I wrote it sort of with a fresh uh, perspective, and and finally got it sold. Yeah, wow. Um, well, that's so. Your relationship with is uh, Judy Singer kind of has gone on this whole time. Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, it's definitely stopped <laughs> since her <laughs> parole hearing. She um, was released in October, like just a couple of weeks after the book came out. Um, she Her sentence had been commuted, so it was no longer life without parole. And then she went up, uh, you know, to, uh, for parole hearing, and they voted to let her out. So after more than 25 years in prison, she she walked out in October. But I was at the parole hearing, and she and I had corresponded. We talked on the phone. I'd interviewed her at length um, back in you know in the early 1990s when I had the contract, and it, we were always pretty friendly, even after she you know she'd sued me. Uh, we established kind of a an interesting, friendly relationship, but. 
by the time I showed up at the parole hearing, she decided that I was against her, and she was she tried to get me not to be able to attend. So um, she wasn't she wasn't successful, and that was a really it was really interesting to see her at that hearing. Um, so I'm glad I was able to go. But since then, I really haven't heard from her. Oh yeah, well probably not. Um, <laughs> So, what, what can you talk about? Like, what exactly it was that got her convicted? Like, what what mistake did she make? Well, the mistake she made was, I think, to sleep with the lawyer. Um, you know, talk about, <laughs> <laughs> talk about self destructive. Her husband was going to go to prison and protect her forever. He was so in love with her and so um, devoted to the, the three children that she'd had from this former marriage that it was. It was quite pathetic, and so, so he was going to keep their secret forever. And, but then he read these letters, and he was mocked at by the prison guards, and he just couldn't stand it anymore, and um, became a witness for the prosecution. And they, um, you know, he wasn't a, a great witness, but um, he offered some evidence. And then there were his son had been visiting them at one point and overheard her yelling at him about it. And apparently it was all her idea, and she had goaded him into it. Wow. Um, just just going back, you wrote the Marcos book. Did she really have hundreds of pairs of shoes? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just had to know. It's something I They're used to They're in a hear museum the now. That's what I... Really? Five, yeah, 500 black bras. Yeah, they're... Um, this was another. This was another interesting strong woman character. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Another woman. I, I another bet. woman. I think there's kind of a theme there because this was somebody else who kind of styled herself like Judy as you know a, a, this doting mother and a wonderful wife, whereas behind the scenes she was a, a kind of a schemer and a manipulator. Wow. Just a, it's just amazing. Uh, so, at, at the at the end of the day, what do you want people to come away with when they read your book? That's a good question. I think the, most of all, um, I think this book. I mean, it's it's fun. I've heard that it's a really fun read, so I'd want people to enjoy it um, and uh, spread it around. But um, as far as a message, I think that there's a very strong message about the power of self awareness. Um, I was so lucky that I was sort of forced to become more self-aware. And for all those years, I was watching Judy kind of suffer the consequences of not being self-aware. She was somebody who was incredibly obtuse about her own motives. And I think she actually believed some of the lies that she told herself about herself. Um, So she... um, she and I had both um, um, suffered uh, uh, some child abuse, and I saw the the effects of that with with her and and with me, and and the advantages I had of really being able to process it and come out of it. Versus, I think she was pretty much trapped in a cycle, and one of the consequences of that was that's one of the most tragic parts of the book was that she was abusive with her own daughter. Um, who mm. really turned against her in the end. Um, and I think mm. that it wasn't even conscious on her part. She was just repeating what she'd learned. So I really felt yeah. pretty sorry for her. But I also felt like it was a just a huge advantage to be able to get the opportunity to have my face stuck in my own, you know, issues. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this so, so uh, yeah. No, I was reading the other day, James Hollis asked this, he says that the question nobody can answer is, of what are you unconscious, you know? And it's 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 just a wonderful uh, opportunity to be able to kind of think about what are you unconscious of, you know, what, what motives are you following that you're not even aware of? Mm. Well, I live my life that way. <laughs> 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 unconscious, it's just better that way. Not as much pain. If I wake up, it's just it's a bad day. I know, <laughs> denial. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's better to go back in denial, you know, have, have a coffee and forget it. I don't know. Wow. So now this book is a lot more than just this. This, this, this is only one little part of it. So this book is actually um, kind of a memoir as well. You've incorporated a lot of your 
um, experience and, and through life and the journey you took. So um, it's it's more than just about uh, this murder case and Judy Singer. Yeah, I like to think of it as a mashup uh, between Fargo and Eat, Pray, Love and Body Heat. <laughs> it's got different <laughs> elements of all of them. Oh, there you go, see. <laughs> <laughs> when we were working on the subtitle, you know, it's like, okay, so it's Love, Lives, Obsession, and Second Chances. Wait, can I put something else in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. A, eh? like Fargo. Actually, you see... Um, Mike's Canadian. He can talk like Fargo. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> my my brain speaks to me in Fargoese. <laughs> well, the Fargo uh, part is the the people that um, the two men that the restaurant owner hired to kill his wife's former husband were the, the, the most amazing bumblers that you've ever. I mean, it's 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 if if it weren't so tragic, it would be really funny. Um, they they were. It, it, he hired his own busboy, which was kind of dumb to begin with. And then the busboy and the trigger man drove from Flint, Michigan, to Santa Clara, California. They got lost. They ended up in a ditch. They forgot ammunition. <laughs> you know? I mean, they just were the most unprofessional hitmen you could imagine. That's where it gets wow. like Fargo, I think. That's And that's crazy, too. I mean, how do you just come out and ask people if they want to kill someone. Yeah, I know. Like, I, it's just, I could never just figure that out, just in a restaurant. Hey, you want to go kill someone <laughs> for me? Okay, was, yeah. And, you know. Craigslist, I guess. Yeah, the restaurant owner was absolutely <laughs> desperate. He went. There was testimony that he went with his manager. He got his manager to go with him to a nightclub to try to look for hitmen. <laughs> oh. The manager had no idea. What? <laughs> Hey, hey, Mike, let's go to the nightclub and hire someone. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I'll just go dance. Uh, it's just, yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's crazy. Oh, let's find a hitman in, in the disco. I, I don't know. Yeah, I just, yeah. uh, you have to wonder, you know. But uh, uh, So what are your influences in writing? Do you have other people that have, that writers that have influenced you, narrative or is there some sort of style you like best? Hmm, I love I love reading. I mean, it's just one thing that I most love to do, and I, the, the writers that I like are just almost too numerous to to mention. Yeah. So I don't know if I was going for a certain style, but it's interesting that there is a whole mini-genre of um, murder memoirs now, um, which, which I just think is so fascinating because any time that somebody takes on writing about you know a true crime story, you've got to know that there's something that resonates with them psychologically. So to put that out there, I, I find it really interesting. So the fact of a body um, is, is a book like that, which is, which is just great, uh, about a woman who's a lawyer who investigates a case of where, where the suspect was, um, you know, a, a, a child abuser, and she had suffered some child abuse, you know, in her growing up and so it's um it's it's just an interesting thing as a as a court reporter i thought it was it was such a luxury to you know if you're a voyeur at all because when you read court transcripts they're just the most personal look you know it's like you know you say most people are in some kind of denial but when you read arrest records it's like you're peeling away all these layers and just really looking at life as it is mm. That's kind of like uh, how society is now, don't you think? Um, it, it's so obsessed with true crime right now. True crime is definitely, I can't believe how popular it is. It's its really surprising. And it, it, it went down, it, it was having kind of a, a moment when I got my contract from Simon & Schuster back in 1991, and then it plunged, and now it's like I can't believe how many venues there are, podcasts and you know, radio shows and books. Incredible. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. People are really into killing, I guess. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, oh, I boy. think that, but again, I think it's that people just want to know that other people are as flawed as they are, I think. So when you yeah. read these true crime stories, you're really, you're really looking at, you're not looking at the Facebook curated image. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, so what do you got planned next after this book here? Are you, are you planning to continue in this type of writing or do something different? I'm really not sure. I've, I've, I've written three books on ADHD, which is a big interest of mine, and I'm still following that. And I've written a book on the environment, and I'm still following that. Right now, I'm just spending a lot of time you know, promoting the book and writing stories based on the book and um, speaking about it. But I'm also, I've also been doing a number of articles about psychology and psychotherapy, which is kind of something that originated from the book, and I'm really enjoying that. I've been writing for an online magazine called Knowable about psychotherapy and the research into it. Hmm. So psychotherapy is really important, don't you think? It's something that I think probably most people need. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and the, the the research I did for this for this article, it's just it's quite amazing how uh, the people who've been doing psychotherapy have really the number has really declined, while the number of people who just get prescribed antidepressants from their general practitioner has climbed. I mean, if you look at a graph showing these two trends. It's, it's amazing. And part of the reason is that insurance plans are no longer paying as much for talk therapy. Um, even though we're supposed to have parity with mental health and physical health. Um, so it's just not easy to get talk therapy. I feel, again, like I was incredibly lucky um, to be needing it and getting it at the time that happened. It's much mm. harder to find well, a person now. Yeah. Yeah, and it just seems like it, it. I think it just got easier to give uh, pills out to people, and and uh, I don't know. It just seemed to be. It seemed to go that way for a while. It's still the trend is still going on. I mean, it's still increasing, and it's it's quite sad because pills don't cure you. You know, I mean, they'll that pills work on symptoms, but um, it's. I, I really think it's worthwhile for people to understand themselves better. I mean, we have a lot of people in the White House who could probably benefit from that. And Yeah, um, the, the whole place. It's not happening. <laughs> just, just all of them. Just just, yeah. just do the whole thing. Gr- group session. Yeah. Democrats, yeah. too. Oh, yeah, just group session for everyone. <laughs> you know, all ha- hold hands and sing. I don't, I've given up. It's not going to happen. No. Uh, so now you have a website that people can go to if they want to find out about you, your books, and I do. Um, okay. www.katherineellison.com. I also have a Facebook page. If you're interested, especially in anything about ADHD, I keep current on that. Um, I think that's kind of an important issue. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, for sure. That's something we 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 all need to be aware of, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so now the book is out. It's by it's and available through Wild Blue Press and Amazon and all good bookstores. Barnes and, and Noble uh, we're gonna, Yeah. Yeah. We'll have it on our website as well. So people that listen to the interview can just do one click and pick up the book. Thank um, you so much. It's been a it's been great. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. And um, the book we're talking about is Mothers and Murderers. And the guest has been the author and uh, true crime uh, um, journalist, we'll say, (laughs) Catherine (laughs) Ellison. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ellen. It really was fun. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Wave Media.